see my screen? Can everyone yeah. see my screen? I'll, I'll assume the answer is yes, unless someone says yes. no. Yes. 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 That's great. So first of all, thank you for the introduction, Sarah. As you know, I'm a, a, a huge, I'm the number one fan of Fairpoints, and I have attended a number of these meetings as a, as a, uh, as a visitor, uh, as, a, as a, you know, uh, someone listening to other presentations, um, and they've all been fantastic. So uh, it's great, Rob and I. First of all, I have to apologize to Rob for uh, he's he's a co-presenting with me today. So my colleague Rob Day is with us, um, and I have to apologize for Rob for not setting that up in advance. Typically uh, disorganized, uh, but uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's a real. Rory, I'm sorry. Uh, the presentation is not in uh, full screen mode, so you can see the just the presenter, um, the slides, not the presenter mode. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I am so sorry. I forgot to to, to introduce you. So if you give me a minute, thank everybody. This is Rory right. okay, McNeil. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I haven't had enough coffee today. Hi, everybody. This is Rory McNeil. He's the CEO of Research Space, and uh, which provides an electronic R space, the electronic tab notebook, and a research data management platform. He's also the host of the Fair Data podcast, and in this very many roles, he's also uh, we're very lucky to, to have him working with us at, uh, as well in Fairpoints, and uh, he's participates in a lot of other organizations so you might have seen Rory in uh, other places and other uh, communities like the RDA for instance and uh, com other conferences and events so um, Rory is very much of an advocate of fair and open science practices and uh, both him and Rob will be talking to us today so thank you. Okay great um, uh, thank you Sarah and I just just I'm really delighted to see number of people that that I know in who are in the on the call today, which is great. And many of them have a lot more uh, knowledge and learning about various aspects of what we're going to be talking about than either Rob or I do. So um, we've left time at the end for for discussion. And I, I hope that's going to be a really interesting. Um, and uh, so great. So without further ado, let me uh, let me go go forward. So the form today is I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction and set the scene. And then Rob is actually going to do a live demo of a very brief live demo of both the RSpace ELN slash research data management platform and also the new inventory module, which has been integrated with um, the research data management platform. And then uh, he's going to hand back to me and I'm going to talk about some specific things which we're working on, some challenges we face in particular as we develop the inventory module um, with a view to enhancing both uh, both sample provenance and experimental reproducibility. So that's the format for today. And now, can you see my second slide? Yes. Good. All right, so what's the problem? Um, the problem that we're trying to address uh, in particular in regard to samples is that, and this is not a problem which we've identified, it's a problem which everyone's aware of, but lack of reliable information about physical sample usage, location, provenance, metadata, and experimental use is a core barrier to, and this is important to two things. It's a, it's a barrier to both experimental reproducibility. It's also a barrier to comprehensive recording of domain-specific sample metadata. So the agenda for today, as I said, we're going to introduce RSpace, which is a research data management platform come ELN that's been optimized for experimental reproducibility and has also now been integrated with a sample man management module, which is addressing sample provenance issues. And after the introduction, we're going to discuss three specific challenges that we face. The first is incorporating sample data and metadata into experimental documentation. The second is incorporating PIDs like IGSNs and RRIDs into sample metadata. And the third is exporting the sample metadata in required formats to domain repositories and databases. So this graphic is an overall um, picture of, of we, we no longer think so much about, about our space, we more think about the ecosystem 
but anyway, if you look at the center of this graphic, there are three elements to the three core elements to R space. One is the research data management platform come ELN, uh, which is a place for um, dealing with for documenting experiments and and aggregating related data. Second, the sample management module, which is a case for which is an it's an area, it's a tool which enables it's a full sample management tool, and you'll see it in action. And the third important core element is our powerful uh, API. So our space is all about has always been all about connectivity, connectivity with tools, and linking to data. Those are the core concepts that um, that that inform our space. So this enables you to because the R space is not intended to be a uh, data storage tool. Uh, and we understand that people use lots of other tools to collect, aggregate, manage their data. They might be using institutional file stores for things like their sequencing data or their image data, which could be terabytes of data. You certainly don't want to move that into our space, but you might well want to link a particularly relevant uh, data set that's relevant to a particular experiment you're doing, link that um, with the experimental write-up in our space. You're probably also keeping your small data, i.e. things like your spreadsheets, your Word documents uh, in tools like, like the ones uh, noted. Again, we have integrations with those so that you can, you can link or and or bring in those things to, to our space. We have some relatively new features which deal with more specialized types of data. So we have an integration with Pyrat, which is a colony management system. So you can associate your uh, the information about the animals used in research with the experiments one which is just about to be released this week, actually, uh, with Cluster Market, which is an equipment um, equipment scheduling app. So you can now also um, associate information about the equipment you use in the experiment with, with your experimental write-up. Uh, we also have integrations with uh, various uh, uh, protocols, resources like Protocols IO, which I think everyone's probably familiar with, uh, YouTube, and a new one, which again is about to be released an integration with um, the Jove so that you can in incorporate Jove uh, visualized experiments uh, into our space documents and, and view them in line and make a record of them. We also have integrations with other tools, things like Slack and Microsoft Teams uh, for not so much on the data side, but more on the communication side. Uh, and we have support for things that, that some of, many of our um, communities need like, like chemistry uh, and uh, molecular biology. So critically, we also have the ability through integrations with data repositories to then export data sets from our space at, the, at, the, at when you want to share the data, whether that's at the time of publication or earlier, again, to facilitate the FAIR principles. Uh, and you can export um, your ORCID ID at the same time. These purple things show that we've also developed particular support for, for research data managers in addition to researchers. So through integrations with uh, online uh, DMP, uh, DMP tools, data management plans, uh, we now have support a, a very nice workflow where you can actually ingest a data management plan into our space, associate it with the, uh, with the data sets, with the actual work that's done during the project. And then when the project is done, when you're ready to export, you can export um, the R space data. And again, you can export linked uh, you can export documents, data sets which have been linked to in our space. So you're able to, to aggregate data from outside our space along with the data management plan, bundle it all up and export it to a repository. So the data management plan is then associated with the with the R space data sets uh, in, in the public uh, repository. And nicely, um, something we might talk about later on in terms of PIDs, uh, the repository then assigns a DOI back to the data management plan. So I'm going to pass over to Rob now, and he's going to, to kind of show you how this connectivity uh, on both the um, ELN side and the inventory side actually works in practice. Thank you, Rory. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm also going to uh, kill my video feed too as well, just to um, actually give me a little bit more bandwidth here to work with. As soon as I'm actually able to work out how to do that in Zoom, let me just kill my video here if I can. There we go. So that will give me plenty of bandwidth to be able to show you my uh, my my screen share. 
So uh, hopefully, again, everybody can see my browser moving left to right. Um, somebody just yell out yes to let me know that you can yes. see. Yes, yeah. Perfect, okay. So this is actually Safari on a Macintosh, but you can use any modern HTML5 browser you want. Um, we've yet to find a modern browser that our space won't work nicely with. And you can use it on any mobile device uh, or any platform you want that supports an HTML5 browser. Uh, I know that there are some fancy labs now that even have HTML, HTML5 browsers built into the door of their refrigerator. Um, you could use that if you wanted to. I've actually also had quite a lot of success using it with my Wii gaming system too as well, because that also includes a browser. So bottom line is you can use our space with pretty much anything you want. It's totally platform and browser agnostic. I'm already logged into this demonstration server. Uh, there's a lot to show you today. We have uh, you know, a very feature-rich project product. Typically, we, you'll be looking at a couple of hours of training to go through uh, all of the different features on both the ELN and then another couple of hours for the um, uh, inventory system. And we don't have time to go through everything today, but I'll just try and give you a very high level view of how the system works and how these two different modules work together. What you're looking at right now is the workspace. This is essentially the desktop of your system. And this shows you the work that you're currently working with. You can also think of the workspace as being the area that you're generating your official record in, where you're communicating with your downstream audience, whoever that, that is. And it might be your, your advisor or your managers, or it might be your future self when you need to reproduce your experiments. You can select items with the, uh, in the workspace by either clicking or tapping on these select boxes. And that will reveal for you a list of different sorts of actions that you can perform on the various different uh, items, including things like seeing the full revision history of a document in keeping with 21 CFR 11 compliance. You can go ahead and you can copy links and use those elsewhere, either for specific versions of your document, or if you prefer, you can link to what's called the live link, which is always points at the very latest version of the document and which updates automatically. You can also naturally go ahead and do things like share these items, either with any groups or projects that you belong to, or you can share things with any specific individuals who belong to any of those projects. And you can choose what kind of permission you're using. You also have the option, both, both individually and as a lab, to go ahead and turn on something called auto sharing. And that's good for very open uh, environments because actually this will allow you to share everything that you make with everyone else that you're working with all of the time. And whether you choose to share things manually on a per document basis or, uh, or automatically or so that everything you do is shared all the time, that's entirely up to you. Right now, we're actually looking in an area called My Lab Groups, and this is an area that's viewed by the PI. And from here, the PI can see uh, the various different groups and projects that they run. They can see the individual users who belong to any of those groups. And if I want to, I could go ahead and click on the user folder to see immediately the listing for that particular individual users. Now, since I'm logged in currently as a principal investigator, by default, I can easily access with read-only permissions the work of all the people that are working uh, under me. Okay, so there are lots of ways to create content in our space. I can make new folders, new notebooks. I can make new documents based on uh, forms or templates that I built in the past. These are essentially just uh, pre-built workflows that represent things that I do very often. I won't talk about making forms and templates today. It's a bit uh, too long to get involved with. I can also go ahead and import content directly from things like MS Word files, Evernote files, or protocols.io documents. These can all be turned immediately into fully edited, version controlled, uh, fully 21 CFR 11 compliant RSpace documents if I want to. So that's one way of getting content into RSpace. I could, for example, go ahead and say, I'd like to make a new document based on a tissue sample form, and that will make for me a new empty document, which in this case you can see is divided up into a number of different fields. And each of these fields is pre-designed to take specific sorts of, of uh, data. So I could say that the tissue type is liver, the sample ID is this. You'll notice that in this case, it won't let me enter this value because I previously put some validation in this form when I built it saying that I only want up to 5,000 samples. So as long as I put something smaller than that, it was happy to take that value. For format, I could choose one of these different fixed response items that I built earlier when I made the form. I could choose a date. I can choose a location, again, using a fixed response. And then for this last field, I could say something like, um, this is this is liver showing Nash. And now if I wanted to, I can easily add images from either, for example, my local computer. So I could grab an image from here and uh, maybe pick something from my tissues folder. I could grab an image this way and drag and drop it onto the page if I wanted to. Uh, or if I prefer, I could go ahead and add an image that's already in RSpace. 
And that's a very nice feature because it prevents you from adding dozens of copies of the same uh, file over and over and over again. This is a decent sized image that we're adding right now. This one's probably, I don't know, in excess of 10 or 15 megabytes or something. So you can see here, once we've added it, it appears here. But if I prefer to add an image that's already in our space, I could just go ahead and say insert from gallery, which is our file storage area. From here, I could choose an image and now I could say insert and I could drop in that image that I already have. And this means that this image here now is actually possibly being used in more than one experiment. And I can find out whether that's true by clicking on show link documents. And excuse me, it's, it's actually a holiday here. It's Memorial Day and a flight of jet fighters just flew over my house. I don't know if you heard that, but it's pretty deafening here. I could actually, the whole house was shaking then for a second. Uh, anyway, so here are the uh, other different R-Space documents that this particular file has been used in. And I could have also done other things here. I could have dragged and dropped in a sample from my sample tracking system. There's any number of things I could do here. I can also link to data that's in other external systems, like for example, in Dropbox, I could choose to link to a particular document here, and that will immediately add a, uh, a file link to a file that's held elsewhere outside of our space. Um, I'm going to jump back quickly to a, a document that just has some examples of different sorts of rich content you can make in our space. So, uh, if I go to uh, this item here, this particular document just shows a range of different content that I've made previously, including things like different sorts of text and different formats, images with image annotations that have all been added in RSpace, uh, various different files that are held inside RSpace itself. I can view small previews of those, or I can click on view to go ahead and see a high resolution version. Or if I want to, I could open it up in MS Word. I can see images, I can see file types, I can see various different tabular data that I've either created in situ or that I've just copied and pasted onto the page. I can create uh, mathematical expressions, I can drop in code snippets, I can comment on my work and start a nice conversation between people who are collaborating together on this sort of content. And here we can see a list of internal links pointing at other things elsewhere in our space. And I could just as easily link to other sorts of files outside of our space, or I can link to large files that are held perhaps in external uh, file stores, like these uh, links that point at files that are in nearby SMB or SFTP file stores that my university happens to maintain. So there's an enormous amount of different sorts of content we can make, including things like chemical structures too as well. And we have other different sorts of chemistry tools, including things like structural chemistry search. Okay, we don't have a lot of time to go through all the features of the ELN today. So I'm going to jump to the inventory system because I think that's particularly pertinent today. So the inventory system emphasizes a couple of really important core values. Uh, first of all, it can uh, pipe data through the system very easily through its advanced API. So this is the API for the inventory system, and I can get data into or out of the system using that API. If you'd like to know more about the API system, I can actually drop a link to that page into the chat and see if I can. Okay, so there's a link to our API page it just talks about some of the endpoints for moving data into or out of the uh, inventory system. Similarly, there's a help page for our inventory system and I'm going to drop the link to that into the chat too as well. Um, if you're interested in learning more about inventory, you can actually go to our online documentation and you can browse through the different headings here to get a sense of uh, how the inventory system works. Okay, so this is the inventory system. It's divided up into three panels. We have a sidebar, sometimes called a control panel where I can select large areas of items so I can see maybe all of my containers or all of my samples or all of my sample templates if I want to. I can also see my bench which is where I may be holding samples that I'm currently working with or that I'm uh, interested in um, uh, making some changes to or that I haven't yet um, decided where I'm going to put them after I've made them. So you can see there are four items on my bench right now. If I want to I can go ahead and see things like when they were created. I could also go ahead and see things like when they were last moved. And this tells me that these two items have been moved to my bench from somewhere else, but these two items have never been moved. And this tells me that these top two items have actually been created in situ on my bench, and they're still waiting to be placed into some sort of a container that I've already defined elsewhere. The system is highly responsive, and it also emphasizes the ability to view things visually. So this is what's called list view, which is a lot like list view in the uh, ELN. I can select items here and I can perform items, uh, perform actions on those items like editing, moving them to a new location, transferring ownership, exporting all the details as a CSV file, a number of other things that I could do here. Um, but I can also, if I want to, um, while I'm looking at my list of containers, I can specify some filters. So I'm going to say I only want to look at my personal containers, 
And furthermore, I'm going to switch first of all into tree mode. So tree mode now will allow me to tunnel down hierarchically into these different containers. You can see here that in freezer room, I've got a particular freezer. And in that freezer, there's a particular shelf. And in that freezer, there's a, on that freezer shelf, there's a particular box. So when I select the box here in the tree, I can see an image of the item here. And if I scroll down, I can see a mapping of all the items that are in that box. And if I select or mouse over one of these, I can see a summary of the data and I can say open to see that in more detail. I can use this breadcrumb trail to go back to the container that holds that item. And now if I want to, I can also do other things. Like for example, once I select one, you can see that the one I clicked on is uh, selected and has a blue circle around it. But these other ones have been co-selected. And this tells me that this is a family of subsamples or aliquots that all belong to the same sample. So in our space, we always assume that your samples are defined by a set of common metadata, which we usually refer to just as the sample. And then within each sample, there's always going to be one or more actual subsamples. And those that represent the physical manifestation of that sample. And so the subsamples can have locations and containers, but the samples themselves don't because a sample in our space is really just a description of a set of common metadata that defines a family of samples. I can also, if I want to show you what this would look like on a mobile device, if I shrink this down to uh, phone size, you'll see that we can show just one item at a time in here and I can scroll through these. I can also easily go back to the uh, navigational tree that I was looking at before. And I can change down my view if I want to to something called card mode. And what's nice about this is this is now highly visual. So if I go back to my top level of containers, I can see here all of my top level different containers and I could maybe click on one of these and this is going to show me an image of a room. And in that room, because this room is set up to be what's called an image container, um, I use a, a, a main defining photograph to define the container. And then I can place location pointers on that to show me where different things are kept in that different uh, particular location, in this case, a room. So I could, for example, now uh, go back to a wider view to show you what you'll see on a workstation again. And now I could select one of these items and say open. Now we're looking inside that cupboard. And in that cupboard, you can see we've got a number of different items. In this case, we've got some, uh, some slide boxes. It also looks like I'm, I'm being naughty and keeping my tea in that cupboard too as well, which is probably a safety violation, but I can see that it's in there. So if I click on that item, I can see uh, here's a, a photograph that I took on my iPhone of my Thai food tea. That, you know, since I'm English, I'm never too far away from the, my tea if I, if I can help it. And I can see that inside that container, I have a number of different subsamples. These all might represent perhaps different tea bags. And so if I were to click on one of these, I can get information for that item from what's called the details panel here. Now these details panels are infinitely customizable and can be configured to hold any metadata you want about different items. And they can also be configured to um, be automatically created when you first make the sample. So, our space, in addition to having this intuitive ability to show you the layout of your samples, it also has excellent ability to import and export your samples through very simple mechanisms, either through the API, or if you're not really a coder, you can easily do it through a special import mechanism we have. So I'm going to say import, and then I'm going to say subsamples. And now I'm going to select a, a CSV that I'm going to import. So I'm going to use uh, this CSV here, and I'm also going to tell the system that in addition to that uh, set of subsamples, I also want to define another CSV, which actually defines my uh, samples too as well. So now I'm going to be importing two CSVs, a sample form and a subsample form. The sample form, form actually defines a number of different samples, some of which only have one subsample per sample. And then the subsample CSV actually defines for one of those particular samples, I have a whole array of maybe five or six subsamples that I'd like to also import. So now I've defined these two different samples. I also, uh, I can choose an existing template from my template area if I want to. So I could go ahead here and look for a particular template that I know should work here. I'll choose uh, this one. And now that I can look through the, uh, the various different columns that the system has already detected and check that everything's in order if I want to, I'm just gonna skip that step for now. And I'm going to say import. That's gonna actually import my samples if everything works right. And it's gonna place those uh, on the bench. 
And uh, in this case, actually, what, because I've just been mucking around with the uh, CSV file earlier, I just realized I've made a couple of edits to that, but they're probably gonna cause it not to work. So I'm gonna make this a lot simpler. I'm just gonna say import subsamples, and I'll just pick maybe one that uh, that's really simple, like uh, maybe the, uh, the taxane and say upload. And uh, now we'll say for this one, um, uh, we've got to replace that, that we're actually, so this is a whole new um, uh, sample import event. So I actually have to refresh the page here to tell the system that I'm starting over. So I'll say select subsamples, and now we'll say maybe uh, these guys, I'll say upload. And uh, you know, I'm still doing something wrong here, which, oh, that's why, because this is still empty. So let's try and detect this completely. And we'll see if I can say, start over. What I did here was I started an import and then I, uh, I left it in a kind of a limbo and I didn't actually um, import anything. So let's go back to subsamples. Okay, so now we're importing a batch of samples and subsamples. And when we import new samples this way, by default, it'll go ahead and actually place those onto my bench too as well. And it'll put them in a special little uh, virtual container so I can quickly see them and tell me that it's been successful. So here's that container. And here are the different things that I just imported. You can see I've got some subsamples here. I can actually click on one of those and get details of uh, that sample. And I can even see that it belongs to um, a larger family of samples I can click on if I want to. And from here, I can see a range of metadata that was all imported from that CSV file that have all been entered into the, uh, the sample page. Now we can do this with all sorts of different sorts of things. So for example, if I wanted to, I can set up sample templates that correspond to things like known uh, lists of metadata associated with common databases like GenBank, for example. So here's a typical GenBank entry. And what I've already done in here is I go ahead and I say, um, create sample. I can choose from a list of templates that I've made earlier. If I don't see what I'm looking for, I can actually um, I can actually search for the uh, the right template. So in this case, I'm going to say uh, we'll just call this GenBank, and for the sample, we'll look for a GenBank based template. So here's a the template that I'd like to base this on, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this is a lab created sample. A lot of these values are already filled in for me based on the, uh, the sample that I chose. But you can see here, we have a range of different GenBank related uh, sample uh, metadata fields. And some of them I've already defined as being required, like for example, the accession, the accession number. And you can see all of these other samples here are all directly taken from that GenBank page. So if I go back to my samples now and I look for one that I imported earlier, I can probably find this one. And uh, this is a sample now that's made up of a single subsample and all of these different values, uh, are, in this case, I actually manually just wrote in, I copied and pasted the values from the GenBank page. But with a little bit of uh, API magic, you could probably actually bulk uh, in transfer this data. And you could also then uh, send it straight to RSpace, or you could do this through uh, an import via a CSV file. And what's really nice about this now is that you can imagine if I had a whole batch of these now, and I selected all of those in the navigational tree, or I just select a single one and say export that's gonna generate for me a CSV file, which includes all of that metadata that has been pulled from, um, in this case, uh, GenBank. So here are all the different fields and somewhere further down the page will be the actual values that go in the fields. And this is an export of what I just showed that came directly from the RSpace uh, inventory system along with some metadata about that export event. Now, um, what's really nice about RSpace is you can also very easily reference these different samples inside uh, R space too as well. So you could, for example, just copy a link that points at a particular sample. But a better way, a more efficient way to do this would be to build what's called a list of materials that can be used to define what you're using in a particular experiment. So if I go to uh, this experiment and I uh, rename it and I call this um, fair liver, and I say rename. Now I'll open this document. And I'll go ahead and I'll say for this particular field at the bottom of the page, I'll put it into edit mode. And now I'll click new, new list of materials. 
Now there are a number of different ways I could find my materials, but uh, I'm just going to call this uh, fair liver list. And for brevity, I'll use the same thing as a description. I'll say add items. If I happen to know where the items are, I could actually go into tree mode now and I could browse around in my collections to find the thing that I'm looking for. So I could look at my top level containers and I could rummage around inside these containers looking for what I'm interested in. I could look in a particular room and then from there I could look in a particular freezer. But if I don't have any idea where these samples are, a better way to do this is to search for them. And I'll say I'm looking for um, sub samples and I'm going to specify I only want ones that I own. So I can search for those now and go back into uh, list mode. And that lets me see a range of information about these different sorts of samples. Uh, I could, if I wanted to get more information here, I could say, you know, I also am interested in knowing where they're currently located. And this will perhaps uh, narrow down for me the ones that I'm looking for. But for now, I'll just go ahead and stick with a global ID. So I'm going to select all of them. And let's assume we want all of these in our list. Now I'll say choose. That's going to add all of those items to my list here. I could actually specify how many I'm using here. In this case, the quantity that's been defined for these items, but it could just as easily, you can see one here where we have a sample that's actually a, a liquid sample. This is not compatible with the experiment that I'm doing right now. So I'm just going to remove that one from the list. Actually, it looks like there's a couple of those. So let's remove all of those ones that are defined by volume from the list. And now we just have items that are, uh, uh, that we just have, items in the list which are defined by the number of items. This is actually specifically slides it's referring to in this case. And you can see one of them, we've got no slides left for this sample. So I'm gonna remove that one too as well. So now we're down to three slides we'll be using in this experiment. And I could, if I want to specify that I'll be using uh, one slide in this experiment. And you can see that will leave one in the inventory system remaining. So now I can save this. And what I've done here is I built a list of what I'm using in this experiment. And I could even go ahead and move the whole lot to my bench to indicate to my colleagues that those slides are no longer available. They're actually sitting on my bench and uh, if they want them, they can find them there. All right, so here I can see that we've made one list associated with this step of the experiment. If I want to, I could go back to that and make changes to it, but we're not gonna do that just yet. And now I'll go ahead and save this field. All right, so now we've got um, a, an experiment with some data and also a list of materials here. And what I could do now, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and I could, for example, um, export this item and I could choose my format from my universal list of different format options. I could export it as HTML, which would include all of the data in its original format, or I could summarize it as a PDF. Let's actually do it this way. And if I wanted to, um, I could save this PDF locally, or I could even choose to send it out to an external repository. So if I do that, I can then go ahead and uh, it's going to ask me a couple of other options here. I'll exclude my comments because some of the, the comments discussion between me and my PI were a bit sarcastic and we don't really want to use those in the public version of this document. And now I'll say next again. Now I can choose repository to send this to. I, I might choose in this case to send it to Dataverse, but I'd also like to associate it with the original DMP plan that was associated with this experiment. I can choose that from a list of DMPs that I previously imported. If I actually open up another window for you, I can show you that one of the things that our space includes is in addition to the workspace where you record the work that you performed, we also have this area called the gallery, which is essentially like the hard drive of our space. This is where you can store all of your files that you may or may not use in your experiments. The gallery is divided up into uh, different uh, components or subsections. Uh, you can drag and drop items to the gallery or you can import them using a file chooser. But notice that one of the items in the gallery is actually separated based on the source that um, these documents came from. And in this case, these are actually data management plans that came, came from DMP tool online. And this is one of a number of different um, uh, data, management, data, data management plan uh, uh, technologies that we plan to support. So we're working on supporting some others too as well that will let you import your data management plans. And once you've got your data management plan inside RSpace, when you then go to uh, export that document, you can choose to associate your experimental data with the original plan. And when you do that, um, then Dataverse will actually send a new DOI back to the data management plan and embed it in your original plan, tying the entire study together from data management plan all the way through to publication in your repository. And in this case, it would even include all of the samples that I used because I've been exporting this as a PDF that includes uh, a list of materials. I'm actually just going to make an export of this that I'll store locally for now to make it easier to find afterwards. I'll say make a PDF and say next. And now we'll remove the comments and we'll say export. And when you store a PDF uh, without sending out to a repository, it's just placed in a special area of the gallery called the exports area. 
So actually here's the PDF that I just generated. I could view it in high resolution in my uh, computer or my mobile device if I wanted to, or I could go ahead and just download a copy of it. And when we look at that downloaded experiment that I've just downloaded as a PDF file. So here's the PDF I downloaded to my local computer. Notice that for traceability, it's actually including the original link that points back at the original um, RSpace document from which this was derived. Uh, I can go ahead and see all of my data in here, including the other images and everything else that was in there. But you also notice here's the list of materials at the end too as well. And you can see there are three subsamples we used in this experiment. And these links here are also live too as well. So if I wanted to, I could click on the, those and it will take me straight back to the uh, original sample too as well. Best of all now, if I go ahead and I, I copy this um, unique identifier like this, and I now go back to uh, our space, one of the things I could do is under the uh, audit area that shows me everything I've ever done in our space. I could click get audit report if I wanted to, and that would just show me a list of everything that you've seen today while I've been watching. But one of the things I can do here is I can sort this by identifier. So I can put in that sample number and say get audit report. And now it's gonna show me everything that's ever happened to that sample in its life, dating back to the uh, earliest time of when it was first created back here. And now I can see every interaction that anyone has had with that specific sample, right up until the most recent events where I went ahead and made an edit to it here, and then I read it some more here. So uh, you can see here that we've got great ability to be able to track the history of this sample throughout uh, its lifetime and th through its use in various different experiments. And we also have excellent ability to be able to uh, export it. I'll show you one other really nice thing that we just added that's a new feature now. If I go back to that fair liver document one more time, and I look at the list of materials that we generated that was used in this experiment, one of the options ha I have is I can actually export this whole uh, cohort of data. I can say I want to export the whole thing as a, as a CSV file. And now there are a couple of things that I might do with this. Uh, one of the things that I might do is if I'd like to have a complete listing of absolutely everything that's known about these samples in the experiment itself, I could actually take that uh, CSV file that I just downloaded and I could go ahead and grab it and drag and drop it back onto the page itself because that's going to be a much more extended list. In the, um, in the list of materials, you can see we only have a very brief list of summaries of which samples I used. And you could find out more by tracing it, by clicking on these links here to go to the, uh, the sample if you wanted to and learn more about it. But if you feel like you want a lot of that data embedded in the uh, experiment itself, then you can actually go ahead and just embed the CSV file that you previously made. So I can view that now. And here's a CSV file, and it's got a full listing of absolutely everything that we know about all those samples. And in fact, um, this is a PDF version of it that's viewable in our space. But to see it in all of its CVSE glory, a better way to do it is to open it up in something like uh, Open Office, and that will show you the full report. So this will show me everything that I know about the different, the three different liver sections that I used in that particular experiment. You can see here all known metadata is included in this report. Hey, hey, and, Rob, I think. Yeah. Um, we should probably wind up because I, uh, we're getting close no, to the- No problem. We're actually the basically, hour. that's it and, anyway. I'm and I just, I just want, and plus, so um, if you um, bear with me, I'll give me three minutes and I'll, I'll highlight the three challenges that we're looking at currently with um, further development of the inventory. And then I know there's some questions we can- uh, Let me stop sharing my screen. So thanks, Rob. That was uh, that was great. Thank you very much. And um, yep, everyone can see my screen. I'm assuming the answer is yes. So uh, there was the demo. Um, so the three challenges that we're three main challenges we see in relation to sample management in particular are the first is incorporating sample data into experimental documentation, and we've already made pretty good inroads into that uh, through the list of materials that uh, Rob just showed. And the second and the third I'd like to just briefly touch on now, one is incorporating PIDs uh, into sample metadata. Uh, and then the third is exporting sample metadata into domain repositories and databases. So to take the first one, um, we, we are assuming um, that unlike the case of experimental data, which can happily go into generic repositories like Dataverse and Zenodo, um, domain specific PIDs are most useful common in relation to samples. And our initial focus is on two kinds of PIDs, uh, IGSNs, which happily now um, 
as Rory can probably tell us more about if we had time, uh, is, is in the process of uh, a very nice integration with data site DOIs. And then research resource identifiers, uh, which is a project out of um, UCSD, uh, which is being developed specifically to describe uh, resources like antibodies, model organisms, cell lines, and, and plasmids. So we have a several stage um, uh, project to make this happen. The first is you can add a text field to a sample template and enter the IGSN or RID, and that, that's already available. Uh, that's just the basis. And then in stage one, uh, to make it possible to use an identifier, uh, use case one is if the user already knows the identifier and, 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 and searches for the identifier through our space, uh, connectivity with, um, uh, with, uh, with relevant databases. And the second use case is the user just doesn't have an identifier, but wants to register one. And through a series of, of uh, drop downs, it will be able to do that through the um, inventory interface that Rob just showed you. Uh, stage two is a bit more sophisticated, uh, better pushing and pulling of data. Uh, so one thing would be to import the item's metadata that's held in the relevant registry into the inventory system, creating fields with the appropriate types and populating them. Um, secondly, if the relevant authority provides an API for registering items, enable registering a new identifier from within inventory and pushing the metadata to the registry. And then the third stage is support for specialized workflows like the ability to add two different identifiers, um, warnings and checks for identifiers, and then institutional management, which would enable um, institutional reservation and, uh, and usage of particular sets of, um, uh, of identifiers. Um, so, and the third uh, and final uh, challenge that we're working on, which actually Rob showed, we've already done kind of a, um, rudimentary support for this, is exporting sample metadata in required formats to domain repositories and databases. And Rob's already actually showed this in the demo. I didn't realize he was going to do it, just to reinforce it. Uh, this is an example of, of, a, of a GenBank entry. Um, and this uh, is, uh, my screen's obscured a bit by uh, Zoom, but anyway, uh, it's a, um, uh, a corresponding sample template. And then the actual uh, sample uh, itself filled out with, filled, template filled out with information about that sample uh, in our space that corresponds to the GenBank entry. And then um, it's possible to export the completed data uh, in CSV format, and then working with the various submission um, tools and protocols with GenBank to um, export into GenBank. And this is something, uh, a similar example with, um, in the case of Chevy, this is the Chevy entry. Uh, this is the corresponding template in our space. And then you could create a, a CSV and export uh, as you could with um, uh, the case of the GenBank one. So, our specific sample management objective, which we're heavily focused on at the moment, the sample objective, uh, just to summarize what we're doing with samples, which is today's topic, is to enable distributed collection of specified sample data and metadata, including PIDs, in pre-assigned formats, templates, corresponding to templates in databases like GenBank and Chebby, an automated deposit of the completed templates into the appropriate database. So if you will, that's half of our project because the other half is equally important. So the overall objective, what we're trying to do with our space is to uh, build support for a workflow that supports both experimental reproducibility and comprehensive capture of sample metadata. So we already have um, built in the experimental reproducibility through the ability to incorporate DMPs uh, and um, uh, export to uh, generic uh, repositories like Dataverse uh, and Figshare. What we're working on now, as we've discussed today, is kind of a parallel workflow that uh, goes on with sample metadata uh, and which enables data sample metadata, including things like PIDs, uh, to be deposited into um, the relevant uh, repositories and registries that deals with, with samples in particular, so that both the experimental reproducibility and the um, sample metadata capture um, is supported. 
so thank you very much for your patience. And I know there's a bunch of questions and there's not much time, uh, five minutes. So here we yeah. go.